I guess the classical example of uh, machine learning and information retrieval is text classification. So this is if you, if you have bits of text and you want to classify them in some way. So you're basically predicting a, some kind of a class or a category or a label for a text and things. Um, so it could, be, it could be as simple as spam detection. Right? You're trying to build a system where emails come in and you're trying to decide is this email spam or not spam. Uh, you could do uh, things like censorship prediction, right? You've got a post uh, and you think it's a little bit controversial, so is this going to be censored or not censored? Um, so uh, you might be working for a company and this company might have a product of some kind and they might be interested in analyzing what do people say about their products? Do they like them? Right. So, uh, and you can do a lot of these things automatically, right? So you can take blog posts or tweets and, um, and uh, try to figure out what is the sentiment. Are they positive or are they negative? And you can do it in the simple sentiment modeling ways, or you can build a classifier uh, for doing that, right? Uh, so, uh, or you can do things like that, right? So maybe you're, uh, maybe you're working in uh, one of the big banks and you're trying to predict how the stock price or how your portfolio is going to react to a particular bit of news uh, being released. So that's another uh, example of a classification problem. In all of these cases, you have a bit of text, an email, or a, a, a tweet, or a news story, and you're trying to put one or more, uh, one out of a set of labels on it, right? So will it go up or go down? Do they like us? Do they hate us? Is it spam? Is it non-spam? Um, and there are examples like this all over the place, right? So for example, um, customer service companies that have to deal with emails Emails come in and they like to classify those emails, right? Is this guy asking about uh, the special deals that we have or does he have a problem with his phone or does he want to complain about somebody? Uh, so, uh, and depending on that classification, you would route it to the appropriate human. Or in the limit, you could actually imagine if the guy is asking a particular question and you've answered that question a thousand times, so you classify it, figure out that it's a question, uh, that it's this particular question, and then you can just answer it automatically. That would be the holy grail of uh, customer relations, right? Uh, for them, not for you as the customer, of course, because you ultimately would like a human uh, to be on the other side. <coughs> so, uh, so these are all examples of classifications, right? And in all cases, uh, for all of these, you have a small number of labels Right, uh, and you typically have lots of training examples. So you can use your standard machine learning uh, tricks, right? Uh, take your training examples and based on those, learn some kind of a uh, decision boundary and predict what happens for a new uh, document D, for a new text D, right? So uh, let's look at a couple of examples for how we do this. And we've actually had one method for doing this already. You remember when we talked about relevance feedback? Right? So uh, you have a query and the user says these documents are relevant, those documents are non-relevant, and we had a particular method for doing that. Right? We had uh, Rocchio's algorithm. And, um, and we, uh, you can use that for classification. It's not a particularly good algorithm, but it's an excellent entry point for what we're going to talk about uh, in this lecture. Right? So what does Rocchio do? Uh, Rocchio computes centroids, right? So our text is a vector over terms and assume that it has TF-IDF weights and its unit length and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so is every other training example. So how would Rocchio work in this case? Well, Rocchio looks, looks at centroids. So you're going to take the negative class, so examples that suppose were, uh, you know, users who hate our product or things that are not spam, uh, and you compute a centroid vector for the negative class, right, just average them all out, uh, and you compute a positive centroid, and then the way that Rocchio algorithm works is basically for a new document D, it's going to look at which centroid is it closer to. Right, that's, that's what it basically does at some level. Right? So you're going to be computing a similarity between the new document D and C minus, between D and C plus, and based on that, decide how you're going to classify it. So in this case, D looks like it's closer to C plus, so you'd say, yeah, it's probably positive rather than negative. Right? Uh, and so the centroids, of course, they don't represent the, uh, they don't represent all the documents in the class, but they represent the center of mass. That's, that's what they are. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, these similarities, so they could be just cosines for all I care. Right. Um, now, um, if we assume that all the documents are unit length already, then um, 
think back to the third lecture that we had. Uh, cosine is really the same thing as a dot product. Right? So if you just measure a dot product, if you just compute a dot product between d and a positive centroid, that's the same thing as a cosine if both things are normalized. And if c is not unit length, well, OK, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Right? So uh, dot products are a measure of similarity. So another way you could write this out is you could say, well, um, I'm going to take our document, I'm going to do a dot product with a positive centroid, with a negative centroid, and if the positive is bigger, then it's positive, otherwise it's negative. Great. So um, now, in terms of a decision boundary, that's the kind of a decision boundary it would have. Right? Why? Because we're in Euclidean space, and anything to the left of this line is closer to this centroid, anything to the right of this line is closer to C plus, and anything on the line is equally distant from both of them. So that's our uh, decision boundary. So we could write our decision boundary like that, as which one it's closer to. We can also write it another way. Right? Uh, see, we're multiplying the same d by c plus and c minus. So what we could do is we could just subtract c minus from c plus, call it w, and rewrite this whole thing as d transpose w is greater than zero. So, so you have some vector w. It's not a centroid anymore. It's a difference between the centroids. And if the dot product of that thing or the similarity with that thing is bigger than zero, then we would classify it as positive. Smaller than zero, then we would classify it as negative, right? So uh, this is all kindergarten stuff. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to relate the Rokio algorithm, which you're familiar with, to the more generic machine learning things, right? So now we know what this W is. And it turns out that this W, uh, you can actually think of it nicely in terms of the decision boundary, right? Because think about what C plus and C minus were. Everything in here is a vector, right? So C minus was a vector. C plus was a vector. And if I do a difference, c plus minus c minus, well, what is that? That's just a vector difference. So that's a guy that looks like that. That's our w. That's what w looks like. And that turns out to be a vector that is perpendicular to your decision boundary. So it's a normal vector. So uh, if, you're, if, you're taking any, if you've taken any flavor of machine learning, you've seen these normal vectors all over the place. So that's, that's the guy. And that's how it arises in the very simplest uh, possible classifier, the Rokio classifier. Right? So we have our weight vector, and uh, if the dot product of the weight vector with our document is positive, then we would classify the document as positive. Great.